Coming up on today's Airborne, the Blue Angels and the Thunderbirds will fly again on a limited schedule. Dreamcatcher spacecraft makes its first flight, but is damaged after landing. And Galveston Gal P-51 goes down near Galveston Island. Welcome to Airborne on Aero TV. I'm Ashley Hale. Well, we have some tempered good news. The Pentagon has released word that the Blue Angels, the Thunderbirds, and other military outreach programs, also known as air shows, will resume next year. But cost-cutting measures will result in reduced schedules. Defense Secretary Chuck Hagel outlined the Pentagon's new strategic approach to community outreach in an internal memorandum to service chiefs and other military leaders. Many activities, including the Blue Angels and Thunderbirds air demonstration teams, will resume, but at a more limited frequency than in previous years. This cost-cutting measure will yield a savings of $104 million in fiscal year 2014. A senior defense official noted that this plan reinstates a 45 percent reduced capacity for the jet and parachute demonstration teams. A Pentagon spokesperson said that Secretary Hagel believes the Defense Department must preserve vital links between its service members and communities across the country. Sierra Nevada Corporation's Dream Chaser Lifting Body spacecraft conducted its maiden flight at the Dryden Flight Research Center last Saturday. However, mechanical failure during landing resulted in it flipping over on the runway. SNC's Dream Chaser is one of three vehicles selected by NASA for their commercial crew development program. The Dream Chaser carries on a developmental history of lifting body aircraft that started in the mid-1950s, but was abandoned during the race for the moon for the simpler space capsule and parachute combination. But now SNC believes their spacecraft will continue the legacy of the space shuttle in transporting crews to the International Space Station. After being released from an Ericsson Aircrane helicopter, the unmanned Dream Chaser's automated flight control system steered the vehicle. The vehicle adhered to the design flight trajectory throughout the flight profile. Less than a minute after release, Dream Chaser touched down at Edwards Air Force Base. While the failure of the left landing gear after touchdown led to the accident, SNC reported that the high-quality flight and telemetry data throughout all phases of the approach and landing test will allow SNC teams to continue to refine their spacecraft design. Unfortunately, we have some sad news from the Texas Aviation Hall of Fame. Their World War II P-51 Mustang, named Galveston Gal, went down in the water north of Galveston Island last Wednesday resulting in the fatal injury of two people on board. The museum offered flight experiences in the P-51 as a fundraiser. Those on board were identified as Keith Hibbett, the pilot of the airplane, and John Stephen Busby, a tourist from the UK who had made a donation for the privilege of flying in the P-51. According to museum president Larry Gregory, Hibbett was a very experienced former military pilot who had been flying the museum's airplanes for over a decade. Quote, he flies everything we have, Gregory said. ANN offers our condolences to the families involved in this unfortunate accident. We'll keep our readers and viewers updated as more information becomes available. The FAA was expected to issue a final rule this month concerning airline pilot training, but the agency issued a statement last week stating that the release of the final rule has been delayed because of the partial government shutdown. The notice of proposed rulemaking was crafted in part as a response to the accident involving Colgan Air 3407, in which pilot training standards were brought into question. According to a government statement, the FAA planned to issue the pilot training rule in October. However, the employees at the Federal Aviation Administration, the U.S. Department of Transportation, and the Office of Management and Budget, responsible for finalizing the pilot training rule, were furloughed under the shutdown. These rules are expected to dramatically increase the flight experience requirements for airline co-pilots. No timeline has been given for the release of the new pilot training rules. The Master Instructor Continuing Education Program is transitioning to an internet-based application process. Other program improvements have included overhauling the Master Instructor's LLC website, 
creating a Facebook page and a YouTube channel, and producing a new brochure. Although the online process offers an improved user experience, applicants must still meet the same standards to earn a MySEP designation. Program Administrator Joanne Hill commented, quote, not only is the online process more efficient, but also results in much stronger submissions by applicants compared to the old paper method." End quote. Master Instructors LLC claims its MISEP is a professional approach to a professional accreditation that offers a family of designations for aviation educators based on advanced professional standards and rigorous peer review. Launched in 1997 after two years of research and development, MISEP was the first accreditation program of its kind. After December 1, 2013, all MISEP applications must be submitted using the new online system. Lithium-ion batteries have been around for a while in computers, and they've started to appear in other home-use appliances, but they're now headed your way for general aviation use. True Blue Power will host a series of educational seminars to discuss the safety and utilization of lithium-ion battery technology in aviation. A total of 13 Lithium Batteries 101 sessions are planned beginning at the Aircraft Electronics Association U.S. Central Regional Meeting in Kansas City, Missouri on November 6th through the 8th. Twelve more presentations are planned during 2014, including four international events. Rick Slater, True Blue Power Division Manager, said, quote, not all lithium chemistries are created equal. We have performed rigorous testing and worked closely with A123 Systems to design and qualify the industry's most advanced lithium-ion battery systems for aviation. Sharing what we've learned during the process is a logical and worthwhile endeavor." End quote. When Walter and Olive Ann Beach founded their namesake company in 1932, the Beach Aircraft Company, they created a long-lasting legacy. However, in recent years, Beechcraft has changed ownership a few times, and it may be headed for another takeover. The Beechcraft Corporation, which emerged from bankruptcy earlier this year, is said to be for sale again, and Textron, the parent company of Cessna and Bell Helicopter, is reported to be among the suitors. Textron CEO Scott Donnelly said last year when the Chinese were making a play for the then Hawker Beechcraft that the company could be a good fit for Textron if the price was right. The twin turboprop King Air would be a nice complement to Cessna's family of corporate jets and the single-engine caravan line. The King Air is Beechcraft's most profitable airplane. Could a Cessna King Air be in the future? We'll keep you posted. You're watching Airborne. More in a moment. Redbird Skyport is a multifaceted aviation laboratory charged with developing innovative solutions to the issues facing the industry. It started out as a vision for a laboratory where we could objectively measure the systems and the processes that we were developing. Being able to put some objective measures behind the anecdotal evidence that we have about the value of motion and the application of this technology is very, very important because until we can objectively measure it and play that data back, we can't design training systems that make the best use of it. For more information about Redbird Flight Simulations as well as Redbird's new Skyport, visit www.redbirdflightsimulations.com or www.redbirdskyport.com. Welcome back. If you'd like to suggest a story for Airborne, Aero TV, our website, or podcast, drop us an email to news spy at aero news.net. Demand for jumbo jets has slowed down a bit. And Boeing says it will adjust the production rate for the 747-8 program from 1.75 airplanes to 1.5 airplanes per month through 2015 because of lower market demand for larger passenger and freighter airplanes. Eric Lindblad, vice president and general manager of Boeing's 747 program, said, quote, This production adjustment better aligns us with near-term demand while stabilizing our production flow and better positions the program to offer the 747-8s when the market recovers." Quote. 
He added that Boeing continues to have confidence in the 7478 program. The company expects long-term average growth in the air cargo market to begin returning in 2014 and forecasts global demand for 760 large airplanes, such as the 7478, over the next 20 years, valued at $280 billion. To date, the 7478 has accumulated 107 orders for passenger and cargo versions, 56 of which have been delivered. The production rate change is not expected to have a significant financial impact. The Flight Training Industry and Design Conference, better known as the Redbird Migration, started yesterday, and it will continue through tomorrow at Redbird Skyport on San Marcos, Texas Municipal Airport. Jerry Gregoire, Redbird President and CEO, said, quote, Based on my calculations, at this rate, within seven years, the Migration Conference will be the size of Oshkosh. Gregoire continued, quote, We have a terrific list of speakers, sharing ideas with a lab and your peers, the Red Hawk airplane to fly, the debut of a truly new full-motion helicopter trainer, and interesting dinner conversation to make this a great conference, end quote. For those who can't attend in person, you're missing out on a great program of speakers. But don't despair, ANN is here to help. The Aero News Network will be streaming the entire conference live with replays of key speakers and events throughout the day on both the Migration website or at aero-news.net. And now it's time for our Aero Video of the Week. Today's Aero Video of the Week is about RC model airplane flying at its best. At the iCare Air Meet held in Germany, these fantastic RC model World War II planes show impeccable craftsmanship and look believably real in flight. They even demonstrate that like the full-scale planes, landing can be tricky. Find the 6 minute 27 second video on YouTube by searching iCare Reunion 2012. How about a flight to near space? That's 20 miles above Earth, without a rocket, noise, vibration, G-loading, or weightlessness. A company called Worldview has announced plans for human flight into near space that it says will be unlike any other suborbital spaceflight experience being offered today, allowing passengers to remain aloft for hours at a comparably affordable price of only $75,000. Worldview says its spaceflight experience will begin with a gentle ride in the comfort of a luxuriously appointed space qualified capsule, lifted by a high altitude balloon to 20 miles. Passengers will remain aloft for approximately two hours before gliding back down to Earth. The vehicle is being developed by Paragon Space Development Corporation. Jane Pointer, CEO of Worldview, said, quote, We look forward to pioneering this new accessible and affordable spaceflight regime and to sharing a breathtaking once-in-a-lifetime experience with people from around the globe, end quote. Well, that's our program. Remember, you can get comprehensive, real-time, 24-7 coverage of the latest aviation and aerospace stories at aero-news.net. I'm Ashley Hale. Thanks for watching.